When Beowulf arrives, he responds to Hrothgar's despairing lament in true Germanic fashion. He says, Wise sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us, living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. In the pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon vision of the world, loss is a way of life. The proper response is to face and fight it manfully, even though there is no hope of ultimate victory against loss and suffering. Beowulf summarizes this course of action in line 1395 when he exhorts Hrothgar again by saying, Endure your troubles today, bear up, and be the man I expect you to be. Loss and suffering may be inevitable, Beowulf says, and death may swallow all of us in the end, but we can still act like men today and battle down the evil that we can while we still draw breath. This determination to not go gentle into that good night of death, as Dylan Thomas put it, is the reason that many have become enamored of Germanic and Anglo-Saxon culture and poetry, men like C.S. Lewis and, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien. Following his own exhortation, Beowulf again offers to aid the Danes by hunting down the monster mother. But though Grendel's mother was not as strong or courageous as her son, she will be far more difficult to defeat. She lives at the bottom of a deep, serpent-infested fen. The monster left Asherah's head at the foot of the cliff near the fen, the water infested with all kinds of reptiles, writhing sea dragons, and monsters. Beowulf arms himself for this fight, uncertain of what lies ahead. Death is likely, so he makes arrangement for Rathgar to care for his men. Unferth, perhaps sobered by Beowulf's victory over Grendel, offers Beowulf his ancient sword, Hrunting, which had never failed him in battle. Beowulf accepts this heirloom sword and bequeaths his own sword and guest gifts to Unferth, should he die in the fight and be able to return the sword that he borrowed. After making his formal boast, he dives into the mirror. Beowulf spends the best part of a day, the poet says, sinking to the bottom of the fen. The monster mother swims out to meet him, grappling him in her talons and dragging him back to her hall. She lunged and clutched and managed to catch him in her brutal grip, that wolfish swimmer, carried the ring-mailed prince to her court, so that for all his courage he could never use the weapons he carried. The monster drags Beowulf into her hall, some hellish turnhole, the poet says, enchanted to keep the water out. The monster's hall is the antithesis of Heorot, an inverted mead hall. In this magical, monstrous hall, warriors are not feasted, but feasted upon. There is no community, no fellowship here, only two lonely monsters gnawing on a grudge as old as the world. As soon as he is released, Beowulf strikes the tarn hag but the shining blade refused to bite. It spared her and failed the man in his need. This is the first sword that fails Beowulf. He flings it aside and trusts again in the strength of his hands, once again wrestling with the monster in an archetypal struggle between good and evil, between man and the wickedness in the world. In the struggle, Beowulf is thrown to the floor and the monster stabs him with a broad, wetted knife. But Beowulf's chainmail is Wieland-fashioned, forged by the greatest of legendary smiths named Wieland, and it turns the edge and tip of the monster mother's blade. Despite the strength of his armor, Beowulf would have perished had not holy God decided the victory. This reference to God's sovereignty is another editorial insertion of the poet's own theology and worldview, this time explaining the real Christian dynamics behind the pagan events of the poem. God is at work behind the scenes, even in the pagan world, the pagan past, the poet is saying. Unbidden help comes to Beowulf in the form of another ancient sword, forged by giants and resting in the monster's hall. An ideal weapon, one that any warrior would envy, but so huge and heavy of itself, only Beowulf could wield it in a battle. A single swing and the blade bit deep into her neck bone, hewing off the monster's head. Instantly, the hall brightens, and Beowulf sees Grendel's corpse, which awakens his fury at the memory of Grendel's violent attacks on Heorot. Beowulf cuts off Grendel's head as well, an allusion not only to David and Goliath, but also to the Genesis 3.15 prophecy that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. 
Grasping Grendel's head, Beowulf begins his long swim for the surface. Meanwhile, seeing the blood surging on the surface of the fen, the Danes return to their hall, believing that Beowulf has been torn to pieces. It was clear to many, the poet says, that the wolf of the deep had destroyed him forever. Only the Yates wait, without hope, for their captain to return. As Beowulf swims upward, the poet tells us that the droves of sea beasts that attacked Beowulf on his way down have disappeared. By killing the evil one at the bottom of the pit, Beowulf has cleansed the entire fen, purging its evil completely. Finally, in the ninth hour, Beowulf reaches the surface, returning from his watery grave. Now we have to pause a moment to think through the details of Beowulf's fight. Champion of a people not his own, the warrior descends into darkness to fight an age-old evil. He destroys his enemy by decapitation using a weapon forged almost before the world began, a weapon that belonged to his enemy. He then reascends through the dark, bearing battle spoils, and emerges victoriously in the ninth hour. The similarities between Beowulf's heroics here and Christ on the cross are too numerous to be accidental. Christ also suffered to save a people not his own. Using a cross, his enemy's weapon, as his sword, Christ crushed the head of the evil one and destroyed the stranglehold of sin and death. Christ also descended into death, into the grave, to do battle, and then to re-emerge victorious. Most significantly, when Christ dies, he cries out, It is finished, in John 19.30, and then breathes his last in the ninth hour, Matthew 27.45 and 50. His cry is one of victory. With his death in the ninth hour and his imminent resurrection, Christ crushed his enemy's head with the wooden sword found in the house of death. The similarities here are too numerous to be unintentional. Just the mention of the ninth hour, which is unique in the entire poem, is almost certainly a direct allusion to Christ's declaration, it is finished. The Beowulf poet is making deliberate connections here between Christ and Beowulf, connections that we will see grow all the stronger when this hero faces the dragon at the end of the poem.